Hi there, a warm welcome to this day number 328, and today we read Nehemiah 7, Isaiah 37, and Colossians 1. May the Lord bless as you listen. Yesterday we heard how Nehemiah stood up for all the people in financial difficulty. The nobles were rich, and everyone else was suffering, even some having no option but to sell their children into slavery. He convinced the nobles to forgive the people's debts and had them take a solemn oath about that. The wall was finished in just 52 days, but Nehemiah was getting more and more threats from Sanballat and his cronies. Nehemiah 7 After the wall was finished, and I had set up the doors in the gates, the gatekeepers, singers, and Levites were appointed. I gave the responsibility of governing Jerusalem to my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the fortress, for he was a faithful man who feared God more than most. I said to them, Do not leave the gates open during the hottest part of the day. And even while the gatekeepers are on duty, have them shut and bar the doors. Appoint the residents of Jerusalem to act as guards, everyone on a regular watch. Some will serve at sentry posts and some in front of their own homes. At that time, the city was large and spacious, but the population was small and none of the houses had been rebuilt. So my God gave me the idea to call together all the nobles and leaders of the city, along with the ordinary citizens, for registration. I found the genealogical record of those who had first returned to Judah. This is what was written there. Here is the list of Jewish exiles of the provinces who returned from their captivity. King Nebuchadnezzar had deported them to Babylon, but now they returned to Jerusalem and the other towns in Judah where they originally lived. Their leaders were Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reeliah, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvai, Rehum, and Baana. This is the number of the men of Israel who returned from exile. The family of Parosh, 2,172. The family of Shephatiah, 372. The family of Ara, 652. The family of Pahath Moab, descendants of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. The family of Elam, 1,254. The family of Zatu, 845. The family of Zakai, 760. The family of Mani, 648. The family of Bebai, 628. The family of Azgad, 2,322. The family of Adonikam, 667. The family of Bigvai, 2,067. The family of Adin, 655. The family of Ater, descendants of Hezekiah, 98. The family of Hashum, 328. The family of Bezai, 324. The family of Jorah, 112. The family of Gibar, 95. The family of Bethlehem and Natofa, 188. The family of Anathoth, 128. The family of Beth Azmaveth, 42. The people of Kiriath Jerim, Kafira and Beeroth, 743. The people of Rama and Geba, 621. The people of Mikmash, 122. The people of Bethel and Ai, 123. The people of West Nebo, 52. The citizens of West Elam, 1,254. The citizens of Harim, 320. The citizens of Jericho, 345. The citizens of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721. The citizens of Sena'a, 3,930. These are the priests who returned from exile, the family of Jediah through the line of Jeshua, 973, the family of Emer, 1052, the family of Pashur, 1247, the family of Harim, 1017. These are the Levites who returned from exile, the families of Jeshua and Kadmiel, descendants of Hadavia. 74, the singers of the family of Asaph, 148, 
the gatekeepers of the families of Shalom, Ater, Talmon, Akub, Hatita, and Shobai, 138. The descendants of the following temple servants returned from exile. Ziha, Hasufa, Tabaoth, Keros, Siaha, Padon, Lebana, Hagaba, Shalmai, Hanan, Gidel, Gahar, Reaya, Rezin, Nekoda, Gazam, Uza, Pasea, Besai, Meunim, Nefusim, Babuk, Hakufa, Harhur, Bazluth, Mahida, Harsha, Barkos, Sisera, Tema, Nezia, and Hatifa. The descendants of these servants of King Solomon returned from exile. Sotai, Hasophereth, Peruda, Jaala, Darkon, Gidel, Shephatia, Hatil, Pokereth Hazebaim, and Ami. In all, the temple servants and the descendants of Solomon's servants numbered 392. Another group returned at this time from the towns of Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Kerub, Adan, and Imer. However, they could not prove that they or their families were descendants of Israel. This group included the families of Deliah, Tobiah, and Nakoda, a total of 642 people. Three families of priests, Hobiah, Hakoz, and Barzillai, also returned. This Barzillai had married a woman who was a descendant of Barzillai of Gilead, and he had taken her family name. They searched for their names in the genealogical records, but they were not found, so they were disqualified from serving as priests. The governor told them not to eat the priest's share of food from the sacrifices until a priest could consult the Lord about the matter using the Urim and Thummim, the sacred lots. So a total of 42,360 people returned to Judah, in addition to 7,337 servants and 245 singers, both men and women. They took with them 736 horses, 245 mules, and 6,720 donkeys. Some of the family leaders gave gifts for the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 gold coins, 50 gold basins, and 530 robes for the priests. The other leaders gave to the treasury a total of 20,000 gold coins and some 2,750 pounds of silver for the work. The rest of the people gave 20,000 gold coins, about 2,500 pounds of silver, and 67 robes for the priests. So the priests, the Levites, and the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and some of the common people settled near Jerusalem. The rest of the people returned to their own towns throughout Israel. In October, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, Nehemiah 8, all the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. In our reading yesterday, we heard the challenge and mocking of the Assyrian chief of staff who brought the Assyrian king's message to Jerusalem with a huge show of force. The challenge was shouted out in Hebrew for all the people to hear. What a thing to happen to a king that Second Kings 18 praises with these words. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commands the Lord had given Moses. Isaiah 37 When King Hezekiah heard their report, he tore his clothes and put on burlap and went into the temple of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the court secretary, and the leading priests, all dressed in burlap, to the prophet Yesiah, son of Amos. They told him, This is what King Hezekiah says. Today is a day of trouble, insults, and disgrace. It is like when a child is ready to be born, but the mother has no strength to deliver the baby. 
But perhaps the Lord your God has heard the Assyrian chief of staff sent by the king to defy the living God and will punish him for his words. Oh, pray for those of us who are left. After King Hezekiah's officials delivered the king's message to Uzziah, the prophet replied, Say to your master, This is what the Lord says. Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messengers. Listen, I myself will move against him, and the king will receive a message that he is needed at home. So he will return to his land where I will have him killed with a sword. Meanwhile, the Assyrian chief of staff left Jerusalem and went to consult the king of Assyria, who had left Lachish and was attacking Libna. Soon afterward, King Sennacherib received word that King Tirhaka of Ethiopia was leading an army to fight against him. Before leaving to meet the attack, he sent messengers back to Hezekiah in Jerusalem with this message. This message is for King Hezekiah of Judah. Don't let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you with promises that Jerusalem will not be captured by the king of Assyria. You know perfectly well what the kings of Assyria have done wherever they have gone. They have completely destroyed everyone who stood in their way. Why should you be any different? Have the gods of other nations rescued them, such nations as Gozan, Haran, Rezef, and the people of Eden who were in Tel Asar? My predecessors destroyed them all. What happened to the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad? What happened to the kings of Shepharvaim, Hena, and Eva? After Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went up to the temple and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. O Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, please, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. It is true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all these nations, and they have thrown the gods of these nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all, only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, please rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Then Uzziah, son of Amos, sent this message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Because you prayed about King Sennacherib of Assyria, the Lord has spoken this word against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and laughs at you. The daughter of Jerusalem shakes her head in derision as you flee. Whom have you been defying and ridiculing? Against whom did you raise your voice? At whom did you look with such haughty eyes? It was the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have defied the Lord. You have said, With my many chariots I have conquered the highest mountains, yes, the remotest peaks of Lebanon. I have cut down its tallest cedars and its finest cypress trees. I have reached the farthest heights and explored its deepest forests. I have dug wells in many foreign lands and refreshed myself with their water. With the sole of my foot I stopped up all the rivers of Egypt. But have you not heard? I decided this long ago. Long ago I planned it, and now I am making it happen. I planned for you to crush fortified cities into heaps of rubble. That is why their people have so little power and are so frightened and confused. They are as weak as grass, as easily trampled as tender green shoots. 
They are like grass sprouting on a housetop, scorched before it can grow lush and tall. But I know you well, where you stay and when you come and go. I know the way you have raged against me. And because of your raging against me and your arrogance, which I have heard for myself, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth. I will make you return by the same road on which you came. Then Uzziah said to Hezekiah, Here is the proof that what I say is true. This year you will eat only what grows up by itself, and the next year you will eat what springs up from that. But in the third year, you will plant crops and harvest them. You will tend vineyards and eat their fruit. And you who are left in Judah, who have escaped the ravages of the siege, will put roots down in your own soil and grow up and flourish. For a remnant of my people will spread out from Jerusalem, a group of survivors from Mount Zion. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. And this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. His armies will not enter Jerusalem. They will not even shoot an arrow at it. They will not march outside its gates with their shields, nor build banks of earth against its walls. The king will return to his own country by the same road on which he came. He will not enter the city, says the Lord. For my own honor and for the sake of my servant David, I will defend this city and protect it. That night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. He went home to his capital of Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshipping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adramalek and Sharezer killed him with their swords. They then escaped to the land of Ararat, and another son, Esarhaddon, became the next king of Assyria. We finished the wonderful book of Philippians yesterday. I count three wonderful promises in that fourth chapter, but note, this time I feel that all of them are really conditional promises, even the last one. If we are going to have God's peace with us, guarding our hearts and minds, and if we want God to supply our needs then we must give attention to how Paul told the Philippians to live and what they were doing in support of Paul's mission. I encourage everyone to spend more time looking at the treasures of Philippians, and the same goes for the book we start today, Colossians. Colossians was written around the same time as Philippians, and Philemon, the wealthy man who owned Onesimus, was a member of this church. This letter has another wonderful poetic portion in chapter 1, Exalting Christ. In all of my recent presentations in Indonesian seminaries, I have introduced our translation by reading Colossians 2 and the first part of chapter 3. The things Indonesians don't understand in their Bibles, and the things I hope you will understand in the New Living Translation, are spiritual realities. The things that are true of us spiritually, which cannot be seen with physical eyes. If we understand those things, we get the opportunity to believe them. If we believe them, we can meditate on them. If we meditate on them, we find them working powerfully in our lives to transform us and release us from our sinful cravings. Colossians 1 This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. 
May God our Father give you grace and peace. We always pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Christ Jesus. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything, in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth, by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you, who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. 
For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Let me start us in prayer. Our awesome God and Heavenly Father, You are the one, the powerful one, who defeated the Assyrian army. Without an arrow being shot, without any human swords, it was by your power alone that 180,000 soldiers died that night. You are the God of heaven's armies, and you make your plans come about. And we thank you, too, for these wonderful words in Colossians. Lord, we can be confident in our hope about what you have reserved for us in heaven. You have transferred us already from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us already into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of your dear Son. And we thank you that he purchased our freedom and has forgiven our sins. Lord Jesus, we can only be amazed at your power, that through you, God created everything, things visible and things invisible, including all the structure of powers and authorities in the spiritual world that we can't see. And you not only created them, but you hold everything in the universe together. Lord, we pray that you would enable us, enable all of my listeners, to understand the deep spiritual treasures in this book, the things that we cannot see but are true in the spiritual world and true about us. Today, I pray that you would give us confidence and hope in you.